For many, the cost of a university degree is simply too high. The New York Times bestselling author, Tara Westover, shares her childhood experience and financial pressures in her memoir, Educated. And she recounted her unorthodox upbringing the last time we spoke. In a lot of ways, I had a really beautiful childhood. I grew up on this beautiful mountain in Idaho. But because my father had some kind of radical beliefs, we were a bit isolated. So I was never allowed to go to school or to the doctor. I didn't even have a birth certificate until you I was nine. You didn't have a birth certificate? No, not until I was nine years old, which meant because we didn't go to school or to the doctor, effectively, according to the state of Idaho and the federal government, we didn't exist. So that's the world she grew up in. And she didn't set foot inside a classroom until she was 17. Successful now, she still doesn't think she's a poster child for the American dream. Westover joins Michelle Martin to discuss why universities should function less like a business and more like a school. And this conversation is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America called Chasing the Dream. Thanks, Christian. Tara Westover, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, congratulations on the success of your book, I mean, which so many people have embraced. Um, and you recently wrote an essay in the New York Times kind of reflecting on some of the lessons you think people are wrongly getting from the book. And I just wanted to read one line from the essay. You said that a curious thing happens when you offer up your life for public consumption. People start to interpret your biography to explain to you what they think it means. When did you first start to notice that? I, I do think a story like mine tends to get put into this category of inspiring resilience. And that's kind of fine too. I don't, I don't mind. But occasionally people would say something to me that took it a little further than that. And they would say, you're proof that the American dream is possible, that absolutely anything is possible for anybody. And that uh, that started to wear on me a bit over time because I just knew I was so lucky and I was also very helped. And I was living in a time where you could actually work your way through college. The university I went through was affordable. I mean, it was really hard, but it was it was still possible. And I'm not sure that's possible today. And so it started to feel, I started to feel a bit fraudulent, I guess, when people would say, oh, you're proof that absolutely anybody can do anything. And I would think, I think there's value to stories of resilience. I don't think that we should completely discount them, but you don't want to weaponize resilience and you definitely don't want to use it as an excuse not to reform your institutions or have a look at what are people facing today and, and how has that changed? The title of your essay is I Am Not Proof of the American Dream. Can't get any more blunt than that. So I want to, I want to ask you to walk me through it for people who haven't walked your walk. So first I want to talk about how hard it can be to be a poor kid in a rich school even to be a poor kid in a middle-class school, like the one that you went to, you went to, to a Brigham Young University, BYU, which at the time was pretty affordable and still is. So I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about what it's like to be on that grind. Yeah, well, I started out working as an early morning janitor, which meant I had to be at work at 4 a.m., which meant I had to wake up at 3.30 or 3.40. So I would sleep in my clothes so that I wouldn't have to get up. And uh, that, that 10 minutes of extra sleep feels, feels like a lot more than 10 minutes when you're talking about 3 a.m. And, uh, and I did it because they paid a dollar more, basically. You could be an early morning janitor and get paid a dollar more than if you worked the day shift. And everything at that time in my life was about money because I, I just didn't have any. And so trying to make trying to make enough for food and rent and in the summers cover tuition, I pretty much had to take every job that I could, working in a cafeteria, serving food for the freshman meal plan, which I couldn't afford, by the way. I wasn't on the meal plan because I didn't have that kind of money, but I, I, was a, I worked in the cafeteria for it. And it was really hard, but it was possible. And then my life changed completely when I applied for a Pell Grant, my, the second half of my sophomore year. I, I applied for and it just changed absolutely everything. It was the difference, I think, between me dropping out of school and, and staying in school was that Pell Grant. You say in your piece, the day I cashed that check is the day I became a student. Well, I, I would say all of us have a limited bandwidth, for lack of a better metaphor, of what we can think about. And there's been a lot of research done on what happens when you are, have a, a massive scarcity in your life, something important, w whether it's love or money. Uh, you become obsessed with that thing. And it's very difficult to think about anything else. When I was, you know, you could have shaken me awake in the middle of the night 
uh, which for me would have been 1am. So I was waking up at three anyway, and uh, <laughs> asked me like, how much money was in my bank account, mm-hmm. I could have told you down to the dime. But if you'd asked me what courses I was taking, I'm not sure I could have told you that was like really far back in my in my list of priorities. And what happened when I cashed that check, I actually started thinking about my classes. I started thinking about what do I enjoy? What do I like doing? I did the required reading. I did more than that. I actually became a student instead of someone just trying to make rent money. And uh, I think what I learned that day is that maybe the most powerful advantage of money is really just that it gives you the ability to think of things besides money. It, it frees you up to think about your life and what you want out of it and what you want to learn and who you want to be. And I just did not have that before I applied for that Pell Grant. One of the things I appreciated about your book is that, you know, you're, it sounds like many of your students were really kind to you. They really wrap their arms around you. I mean, sometimes literally and sometimes figuratively, they really wanted you to succeed. But do you think they understood just how different your life was from theirs? No, I, I mean, I came from a really unusual family. You know, my parents were uh, kind of radical in their ideology. They didn't believe in doctors or hospitals. So we never went to the hospital or to the doctor and never got vaccinated. I didn't have a birth certificate till I was nine. My parents didn't allow us to go to school. I had a pretty unusual upbringing and there were very few people. I, I never met anyone else like that at BYU. I felt kind of on my own in that way, but it was something I wanted to write about and the piece is that I wasn't the only poor kid at BYU, not by, not by a long stretch, you know, so the, there were other freshmen working in that cafeteria who also could not afford the meal plan. And I think it's because Brigham Young University was such an affordable uh, university. And so it attracted people who wanted to work their way through college. It was a first rung on that ladder that was low enough that it, a lot of people got onto it that you wouldn't expect to see at a university. And so there were people, maybe not with my exact biography, but certainly who hadn't come from money who were working their way through. And part of what motivated me to try to write the piece is that I'm, I'm worried that when that first rung is too high up, those kids stop climbing. It becomes unimaginable. And so, you know, for me, the tuition when I went to Brigham Young University was $1,600 a semester. I think it was $1,640. And that was a lot of money for me. I'd never seen that much money, but it was an imaginable number. I could I could imagine myself getting together that kind of money. If I'd looked at the website and it had been $15,000, $20,000, $30,000, dollars everybody knows that college students don't often end up paying that sticker price. Like you get a bunch of aid or you get uh, scholarships or... Or, or, or things come through that, but but think of a poor kid who doesn't understand that system, who doesn't understand how to navigate that. They, you know, and I had a cousin in, in Idaho who got a really high score on the ACT, high enough that Harvard actually wrote her and said, hey, why don't, you, why don't you apply here? And she and her dad, they went to the website, they saw the tuition sticker price and they just closed the browser. They never, they never even looked at financial aid and things like that because they don't know about the system. And so I think, there's something to be said for just keeping the numbers imaginable. They have to be something that if, you're, if your father's a truck driver, if your mother is a waitress, you can imagine that amount of money. And right now, I think the numbers are not imaginable. Well, you know, the, you say in your piece, for kids today from poorer backgrounds, the path I took through education no longer exists. Why does it no longer exist? Those universities that are the first step for a lot of people, whether uh-huh. you're talking about community colleges or in my case, BYU, or just p- publicly funded state flagship universities. That's where a lot of kids go from all over the place. It's their first step. And the tuition at those schools, I mean, the, the Department of Education has said that even after you adjust for inflation over the last three decades, the, the average cost of attending, just the tuition actually of a four-year school, not a fancy private school, but just a four-year public institution, it's more than doubled. And so you start, you start taking, uh, you start making an education just an unimaginable thing where kids don't feel like it's for them. These 16, 17-year-old kids who are, that's the age where you're making massive decisions about your future. And, and I think the message we're sending to them is this isn't, this isn't for you, unless your family has money, unless you come from five generations of, of college graduates, this isn't for you. Kids graduate with tremendous debt. 
And it isn't just a matter of the poorest kids who are likely to get some support if they can figure out how to get it. But what about kids whose parents are on that first rung of the middle class? That right now is what one point is it one point two trillion? It's an incredible increase uh, and an incredible debt to saddle any young person with. We know from the Department of Education that tuition's doubled over the last three decades, right? Uh, even if just for inflation. But if you look at the wages, if you look at the Department of Labor, how much has the earnings of, of people 18 to 29 gone up over the last three decades? It's not even 20%. And so you're talking about this huge increase in the cost to get an education, but not that much increase in the wages to actually pay for it. Uh, so I think that's the no-win scenario, I think, for lower-class kids, for middle-class kids. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you navigate this system with any hope of ever owning a home, with any hope of being out of debt? Like, how do you navigate that? What you said in the piece, you say, to poor kids today, we present a no-win scenario. We shout shrilly that they must get a college degree because without one, they can't hope to compete in a globalized economy. But even as we say it, we doubt our own advice. And then you say that it's almost like it's a you say for them, the American dream has become a taunt. What do you think the consequence of that is? I mean, first of all, let's talk about because you, you've thought about this, obviously, is, you know, what 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 happens when it becomes sort of a luxury good, like higher education becomes a luxury good. What do you think the consequences of that are? Well, you know, there's a Gallup poll that came out in 2019 where they they found that the number of young people, I think it's 18 to 29, who thought that college was very important, had dropped 30 points in uh, in six years. So it had gone from I think 74 percent to 41 percent of kids saying a college degree is isn't isn't important. And we know that that's not a reflection of the economy because in the economy, a college degree is probably more important than it's ever been. So what is that a reflection of? And I think it's a reflection of inaccessibility. When something is not within your reach, it's just human nature to devalue that thing. And uh, so I think that that's going to be the inheritance that we've, we've created a situation where so many people feel like this just isn't a possibility for them. They no longer think it's even valuable. And I think the social implications of that are, are, are really frightening. And the political implications, I mean, education sits at the center of our political divide. Whether or not you have a college degree has a huge impact on the way people vote, the way that they identify themselves, the kind of tribalism that's in our politics is largely starting to be along educational lines. And so I think that is part of the inheritance of making education into a good that is distributed according to wealth, is it, it becomes another mechanism of, of our great divide. You know, it's interesting because in the piece in your book, you you talk about what difference education made in your life. But there's this one scene where you started to be exposed to Black people and the experiences of Black people in America. And there were not a lot in Utah. This is no, they're not a lot in Utah. Utah. This is through nor, books. Nor in Idaho. Yeah, no. You kind of awakened me to the idea of what it would be like for a white kid who doesn't know any Black people reading that and how you would absorb that and how once you became acquainted with realities, how it opened your mind. Yeah, I was, what I was taught about slavery growing up uh, was pretty limited, and I didn't question that. You know, I, it, was the, it was the information I had. It was given to me by people I trusted, and I didn't really question that. And then I got to college, and I was, it was my first time in a classroom. I was 17 years old before I was in a classroom, and I took a class that was a civics course, an American civics course, and that professor taught slavery. And, uh, you know, we had to read the, the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, and we just, we just learned things about it. And um, that was shocking to me, you know, that shifted things for me a little bit. And then I learned a couple months, maybe a month or two later, he taught the civil rights movement, and I had never heard of the civil rights movement. I just, nobody ever told me anything about that. And for me, I was just First, I was confused. I was like, did we get this in 1868? Surely, not 1968. I, I had no idea that these things had continued for so long. And when I read about uh, the civil rights movement, when I, I was in that lecture, I remember he told us the story of Rosa Parks. And I remember he told us that she had been arrested for taking a seat on a bus. So I assumed that what he meant was that she'd been arrested for uh, stealing the bus seat. So that's kind of a ridiculous misunderstanding of like, to take a seat versus to take 
that seat. Mm -hmm. uh, because in my mind, from what little I knew of history, that it made a lot more sense that you would get arrested for, you know, stealing. We arrest people for stealing. I had no idea that we arrested people for sitting. And so uh, that just shifted my whole frame. When I finally understood that story for what it was, and when later he was, he was telling us about Emmett Till, and you really can't misunderstand that story. Once I started to get a grip with what was being discussed, what had happened, what the history was, it shifted everything for me. And, and my family uh, was definitely problematic around race. And I went home and I noticed those things, words we used, things we said that I suddenly was very uncomfortable with. But I had to change. It's just the, the long and mm -hmm. short of it. The history I'd grown up with was really inadequate. Before I let you go, I have to ask you, because there has been such a fight over educational policy in recent years, you've seen a sort of a conservative movement to, to you know, contest with and to fight with the universities as sort of bastions of elitism. And now you're seeing this fight over education policy going into the lower grades where people are arguing over what books they want kids to read or, you know, and that's going deep into the curriculum. So I guess I have to ask you whether you think this is part of a political movement in a way. I think the sad thing is that because because education has been distributed by income and because the income increasingly, you know, all of these things are, are connected to each other. So whether you have a college degree is a strong predictor of how you vote. It's also a strong predictor of what kind of income you're going to have. And so we've allowed these things that should be pretty evenly distributed among the population, uh, regardless of party and regardless of income, to be almost determined by those things. And so, I mean breaks my heart to, to see universities become such ideological, um, become so ideologically tainted in that way where I, you know, I learned about the civil rights movement at a really conservative university. I was a Brigham Young University, you know, a very Republican place. That's where I learned about it. And I, I just don't remember there being this climate of well, we can't even talk about this, you know, I mean, people disagreed and it was a conservative climate, but but you could get exposed to all kinds of ideas there. And I thought that was the beauty of the place. There were conservative ideas there a lot. There were also a lot of progressive ideas there. There was all manner of perspectives. And I get very nervous because I, I grew up in a family where my dad didn't want us to go to school because he didn't want us to be exposed to ideas he didn't agree with. That was one of the reasons. And I don't understand an approach to education that tries to restrict access to perspectives. You know, if if you're living in a in a school district and they're only teaching one thing, I could I could kind of imagine getting a little bit upset with it. But in general, I think exposure to a lot of different ideas and perspectives is just it's a good thing. And you use that exposure to everything to make up your own mind and decide what you think. And uh, so I get very anxious when the debate over what to teach in schools goes to a legislative kind of book banning place as opposed to a war of ideas. You know, you don't like the ideas that are being taught, bring better ideas. Let's have a conversation about it as opposed to banning certain perspectives, which seems very bizarre to me. Tara Elizabeth, thanks so much for talking with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.